Um, cool, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be in Hosea 6. Hosea 6, that's page 904 in these blue Bibles. Hosea 6, 904. Perfect. It's also going to be on the screen, apparently. Brilliant. So Hosea 6, we're starting at verse 4. Let's read together. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. As at Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. Gilead is a city of evildoers, stained with footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. I have seen a horrible thing in Israel. There, Ephraim is given to prostitution. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses, bandits rob in the streets, but they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dew till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the princes become inflamed with wine, and he joins hands with the mockers. Their hearts are like an oven. They approach him with intrigue. Their passion smoulders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fall, and none of them calls on me. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realize it. His hair is sprinkled with gray, but he does not notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. When they go, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like the birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. Woe to them, because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. They do not cry to me from their hearts, but wail on their beds. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. I train them and strengthen their arms, but they plot evil against me. They do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather as your church on a Friday evening. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for Hosea. Thank you for the challenges it possesses. Um, and we just pray for Joel. We thank you for his, his hard work and his preparation for tonight. And we just pray that through his words that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to be open to being challenged. Um, and I do pray we would leave challenged and yet encouraged Father, help us to see something more of who we are before you, but also of what you've done for us and who you are. And would all of this be done for your glory. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Sarah. Do keep that passage open as we look at it together. Steve, just let me know if I need to do something different. We're in business. Great. Well, picture the scene. I'm 10 years old, I'm in an aquarium in New Zealand, and I've just realised that I don't know where my parents are. I don't have a mobile phone, and the only number I do know would ring on the other side of the world at home. I don't know the address of where I'm staying, 
I don't even know which city I'm in. Uh, fairly quickly, my mind goes to the worst case scenario. My parents are going to leave without me, and I'm going to be stranded in another country 11,000 miles away from home, and I'll probably never see them again. I realise that unless my parents come and find me, I am utterly doomed. My heart begins to race, and I feel sick to my stomach. Well, I don't need to tell you how that story ended. I'm standing here, I lived to tell the tale. Uh, but I'm sure you all know that, that same sinking feeling when you realise that you're in a desperate position and you ha can do nothing about it. It's the feeling you got when you uh, walked into that meeting at work that you knew wasn't going to go well. Or when you turned over the exam paper and that topic came up. You know, the one you hadn't revised. Or the feeling when you're all alone in a foreign country, without a phone and without your parents. But have you ever felt that same way? When you think about yourself in relation to God? You see, Hosea is a book intended to show us uh, very graphically and emotionally uh, the horror and the consequences of our sin. And it's meant to invoke an emotional response. As we've been confronted with the depths of our spiritual adultery and the way God feels about it, maybe you felt the beginnings of that sinking feeling. Uh, the realisation that God's standards are really high and that we fall very far short. If you haven't yet, maybe you will tonight. Uh, last week we heard Hosea's call to return to the Lord. And tonight we'll get an insight into what God's looking for when we return. Uh, what it looks like for us to be people who genuinely return to the Lord in a way that he wants from his people. Uh, these are uh, chapters that confront us with God's high standard for repentance and show us the dire consequences of failing to meet it. Uh, by verse four of chapter six, it's clear that Israel haven't responded to Hosea's call to return to the Lord in the first few verses of the chapter. And not only that, but they've turned elsewhere uh, to the nations around them for safety and security. Hosea paints a grim picture of prostitution, murder, robbery, drunkenness, assassinations, and coups. Israel have abandoned the Lord. And the result is that their nation is in a political, social, and religious mess. The worst part, Israel failed to repent and return to the Lord. I will think tonight about what it would look like to genuinely repent, to genuinely return to the Lord. I will see some of the things that can get in the way too. Because like the Israelites, we're people who are incredibly quick to turn away from the Lord and incredibly slow to come back to him. And we can find it so hard to genuinely repent in a real, sincere way that leads to change. And we can find it so easy to look elsewhere anywhere but the Lord for the security and satisfaction that we long for. There is good news, uh, great news for us here, but for us to really feel it, uh, I think we first need to see clearly our helpless state before God. Uh, we'll start by looking at the marks of genuine repentance. Uh, that's from verse 4 of chapter 6 to verse 7 of chapter 7. And our first mark is that genuine repentance is long-lasting. That's from chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Uh, verse 4, your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. I'm sure you can picture that kind of low-level fog that lingers throughout the morning but has gone by midday. Or the dew on your lawn that's there when you leave for work and is gone as soon as the sun shines on it. Well, that's how Hosea describes God's people's love for him. And it's not just any love that God's addressing here. It's hesed love. And that's the steadfast, faithfulness, covenant love that God has shown them. Well, Israel's steadfast love is like the mist. It's got no substance. It's here, then it's gone in the blink of an eye. If that's their steadfast love, what does that say about the rest of it? And I think our love for God can be similar. 
We can have our spiritual high moment at church, or at a conference, or a camp, or a conversation with a friend. We leave thrilled, we're excited by the gospel, and we make all kinds of promises to sort out our prayer life, or get into a better routine of reading the Bible, or to invite our friends to church. We commit to put that persistent sin to death, to be done with it once and for all. And yet it only takes the journey home for our passion for fate to fade, for unhelpful patterns of thinking to creep back in, for our love to disappear like the morning mist. Our repentance is tragically short-lived. And how do we fix it? Well, we start going through the motions again. We think if we could only do the right things and tick the right boxes, then somehow God will overlook our hearts and see our wonderful good works instead. But after condemning their unrepentance in verse 5, God addresses that attitude with verse 6. Look with me. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Uh, The word translated mercy is the same word, hesed, that we saw earlier for steadfast love. It's God saying that he wants our steadfast love, our hearts and our lives, not just an impressive show of good deeds. We can't fool God with Christian activity and assume that makes us right with him. Now that means that serving on lots of rotors at church or having great attendance at home group, as good as those things are, are not substitutes for genuine, lasting repentance. God longs for your heart and your affections. Will you give them to him? Or are you satisfied to enjoy God on a Sunday and leave him behind by Monday? Are you happy to just know about God? Or are you pressing on to know more of him personally and deeply? Are you happy with where you are now? Or are you striving to know Jesus more and more and become more like him? each day. That's a long-term commitment because genuine repentance is long-lasting. Second, we'll see that genuine repentance goes deep and reaches far. That's from verse verse 7 of chapter 6 to verse 2 of chapter 7. Now Hosea shows us that the consequences of Israel's unrepentance go deep and reach far. In verses 7, 8, and 9, Hosea takes the people through a tour of their nation, Adam, Shechem, and Gilead. All places that would have been associated with some kind of wickedness or wrongdoing. It would be like taking someone through a tour of their hometown and pointing out the park where they had their first fist fight, or the club where they got blackout drunk every weekend, or the big house that they spent their entire childhood coveting. Well, the result of Israel abandoning the law, uh, God's law, and turning their back on him is widespread evil. And verse 9, get this, it's the priests who are the biggest offenders. Are those meant to lead God's people are involved in murder and robbery. And in verse 2 of chapter 7, they insult God by assuming that he'll just forget their sin, that he can't see it or that it does not matter. You see, how we treat others is a good indication of how we're relating to God. For Israel, persistent unrepentance and rebellion against God has spilled out into gross evil against one another. And it's the same for us. And we can't fool God with shallow repentance and treat those around us wrongly when we think he can't see. If we're not relating rightly to the people around us, let me suggest that's because we're not relating rightly to God. Now you can say all the right things when people are looking, but God sees when you snap at your kids when you get home, or swear at that driver who cuts you up, or talk about that person behind their back. Now, God isn't satisfied with shows of repentance that lead to narrow, shallow change. If our repentance is genuine, it should be visible in a deep, far-reaching way, particularly in the way we treat one another. 
And thirdly, repentance will also involve putting sin to death. From verse 3 of chapter 7 to verse 7, Hosea moves from talking about the people and the priests to the kings, whose passion for sin he describes as a burning oven. If you've ever made a fire, you'll know that an essential tool is a pokey stick. You know, something you can use to, uh, to poke the, the, the coals or the, the logs around to, to stoke the, the fire into a raging inferno. Well, Hosea says that the leader's passion for sin is like a fire so hot that it does not need stoking. It's all-consuming and powerful. Rather than rebuking sin as they should, their leaders delight in it and feed it. It's a picture here of sin giving birth to more sin. And we see that in our lives too. Uh, the temporary, fleeting pleasures of sin feed our desire to sin more and more. And I don't think we take that seriously enough. Like fire, sin is dangerous and all-consuming. In, in 2003, there was a, a fire in a nightclub in the USA, and the whole thing was filmed on YouTube, though I don't particularly recommend you go and find it. It's a, a horrific video. Uh, but fairly into the, the video, you can, can see the pyrotechnics behind the band set fire to the wall behind them. As the flames creep up behind the band, they play on for close to a minute, are completely oblivious to the danger behind them. Uh, eventually, when the flames reach the ceiling, the band stops singing. And you can hear the, the guy on the mic say, wow, that's not good. Within about a minute, uh, the whole room is filled with smoke. Uh, within five, the entire building's ablaze. And by the end of the night, 100 people lost their lives. Well, Hosea tells us that sin is like a fire. If we feed it or we ignore it, it will consume us. And yet we're happy to flirt with sin and let it into our lives. And the more we do, the more we feed it. How 1 Corinthians 6 tells us to flee from sin. And not try and get as close as you can without getting burnt. And not stand around and watch. And not pretend it doesn't exist. Flee. For the Israelites, on a personal level, feeding sin looks like sexual revelry and drunkenness. And on a political level, it looks like coup after coup. Israel have gone through five kings in a couple of decades, four of whom have been assassinated. And so the nation of Israel is in a mess. And their kings delight in evil as they're assassinated one after the other. Their priests murder and steal and lead the people astray. Violence and prostitution are rife throughout the nation. It should break our hearts to see God's covenant people living like this. And yet the real sting comes at the end of verse 7. Look down. And none of them calls on me. None of them calls on me. You know, we should rightly be shocked at the social and political devastation we read of here. But what should break our hearts the most is that in the face of it all, God's covenant people fail to call on their sin, it is to call on his name, it is their unrepentance that is the biggest tragedy here. And so it is for us. Our God has set a high standard here for genuine repentance. And maybe that sinking feeling is creeping in when we realize that we don't quite measure up, that our repentance misses the mark in so many ways. We want to repent like this, but it's just too hard. Well, we've seen the standard we miss. We'll next look at some reasons that we miss it, some barriers to genuine repentance from verse 8 of chapter 7 to the end. And the first of those is compromise. At chapter 7, verse 8, look with me. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Israel, God's holy, chosen people, set apart as distinctive, have become just like the people around them. If you looked at the conduct of an Israelite, you could not tell them apart from an Assyrian or an Egyptian. And what's the result? 
A frame is a flat loaf not turned over, one that's burnt on one side and raw on the other. It's neither here nor there. They've become disgusting and repulsive, something you can't stomach and just spit out. Well, as God's church, his holy people set apart, we need to be careful that we don't go the same way. You know, it's vital that we, make all, that we do all we can to make the gospel accessible and clear to people around us. Uh, we want to remove all barriers possible. Like Paul, we should be, be willing to become all things to all people so that by all possible means some might be saved. And yet that cannot come at the expense of compromising on the gospel. It's a challenge here to live distinctive and holy lives in the places that God has put us while holding fast to Jesus. So in the office, or classroom, or halls of residence, does your speech and conduct set you apart from others around you, or is the way you live no different to anyone else? Don't kid yourself that you can get drunk on a night out, or date that person who isn't a Christian, or get into a compromising position with your colleague, all in the name of evangelism. Absolutely, spend time with your friends who don't know Jesus, but do not compromise as you do so. We've seen how that went for Israel. They blend in with the nations around them, and as they do, they fail to see their sin and fail to repent. And they don't repent because they look like everyone else. And if everyone else has become your standard, what is there to repent of? And what's worse, they don't realize it. Verses 9 and 10 show us that the second thing that can get in the way of genuine repentance is pride. Hosea paints here a picture of an aging man who's arrogantly clinging on to his youth. The tributes he's paying to Assyria, who are threatening to invade them, and to Egypt, who they're going to for help, are sapping their strength. But in their pride, they don't notice. And worse, they don't turn to the Lord. They're like an aging man who's getting weaker and weaker and yet refuses to acknowledge it or to ask for help, pretending that he can manage on his own. Ultimately, trying to press on without acknowledging our need for the Lord is foolish and dangerous. For Israel, it will end in utter disaster as the Assyrians, to whom they've been paying tribute, invade and ransack the nation. The call here is to humbly recognize our need for God's help and call out to him. It is a healthy, right thing to recognize our limitations and bring them to the Lord. Now, perhaps there are particular situations that come to mind, uh, particular struggles with sin or your health or challenges at work where you are determined to press on by yourself. If you just try a little bit harder and get your head down, then somehow it will all be okay. Let me warn you, that is a dangerous path. And none of us can manage on our own. We are made to be dependent. We're made to be reliant on God. So do not let your pride stop you returning to him in a genuine, lasting way. Well, compromise and pride can get in the way. Uh, the third thing we see is misplaced security. In verses 11 to 13, Hosea describes Israel as a senseless dove, flitting back and forth between one nation and the other, but never to the Lord. I don't have many interactions with doves, uh, but I have had many a uh, wasp or, or fly in my room, and you can do all you can to get it out. You can open all the windows, the door, and that insect will go anywhere but outside. Now, the one place it would be free and safe from my flip-flop is the last place it goes. And Israel's the same. They turn here and there, desperately looking for the salvation that only God can give them. And they're looking to Egypt, of all places. Can you see the irony of this? They're going to their former slave owners instead of the Lord who rescued them in the first place. Like it shouldn't be difficult for us to see the stupidity of their decisions. But we're quick to do the same. And when you're confronted with the, the consequences of your sin, where do you go? 
Is it to the Lord he can save you? Or do you flip from one thing to another, desperately looking for the salvation that only he can give you? And when you mess up, do you turn again and again to the false comfort of that same sin? Or do you put your security in your good works, pretending that somehow they can cover over the wrong you've done? Or maybe your security is in your, your efforts to hide your sin. If only you can hide it well enough from others and from God, then you'll be okay. Well, when we're faced with our sin, if our security is anywhere but the Lord, we're in dangerous territory. For the Israelites, when Assyria did invade, Egypt did nothing, and the nation was swallowed up in judgment. Israel misplaced their security, but they also misplaced their worship. That's the fourth thing that can get in the way of genuine repentance. Verse 14 describes the prayer of a Baal worshipper. Instead of crying out to the Lord, the people try to barter with their idols to save them. They're not interested in God or a relationship with him. They just want the grain and the new wine that only he can offer. Like pagans, they try to manipulate their gods into giving them what they want in a horrific, tragic way. Instead of calling on the true God, as a child calls to a father. Now, I doubt many of us attempted to dabble in Baal worship. But I think our prayers to God can be a lot more like this than we might first realise. Uh, we pray not to know God better or delight in him but for the things he can give us. Uh, we treat God like a good luck charm. He's great to have around when you're sitting an exam or have a job interview, uh, but we're happy to leave him there. Like the Israelites, we want the gifts, but not the giver, and so we've gone elsewhere to look for them. Like them, if we're worshiping the wrong things in the wrong way, we will fail to return to the Lord in a genuine, lasting way. Well, the last thing that can get in the way of genuine repentance comes in verses 15 and 16, and it's drifting. It, God reminds Israel in verse 15 that he has given them everything they've got, and yet they quickly forget and turn away from him. Well, how can that happen? Well, it's not something that happens overnight. Uh, walking away from God is a gradual thing often imperceivable at first. In verse 16, Hosea uses an illustration of a faulty bow to describe this. Now, I'm not aware of any archers in the room, uh, but it's my guess that most of you have had some interaction with a Nerf gun. Uh, they're, they're plastic guns that shoot little foam darts, and they are very, very inaccurate. Uh, that's not a particular problem if you're aiming at something that's close. Uh, but if, for example, you're at the student weekend away massive Nerf gun fight, and you aim at someone on the far side of the hall, there is not a chance that you're going to hit them. Uh, the dart will slowly drift off course till it's nowhere near the target. The longer the range, the further away it gets from where it's meant to be. And Israel are the same. In the short term, they might not notice that much is up, but if they carry on their current trajectory, as time goes on, like an arrow fired from a faulty bow or a dart from an earth gun, they'll be a long way from God before they realize. Without daily encouragement and correction, the natural inclination of our hearts is to slowly veer away from God in a way that's imperceivable at first, but quickly leads to ruin. And that's why daily encouragement from friends, daily time with God and his word, and in prayer is vital lest we slowly drift from him. For Israel, we see at the end of verse 16 that this drifting will result in them being ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Egypt, the place from which God rescued his people from slavery and gave them his covenant law. Well, the result of their sin and their unrepentance to go back to square one. Missing the mark means ruin 
uh, when it comes to relating to God and returning to him, being close enough doesn't quite cut it. Uh, God requires genuine repentance from his people. And so much of our repentance is far from genuine. Now, we might say sorry, but it's a long way from the long-lasted, deep-seated, far-reaching, sin-killing repentance that we've looked at this evening. And we're so quick to misplace our worship and our security. And we compromise in so many ways. We let our pride get in the way. And we're so slow to return to the Lord. Like Israel, on our own, we are in a desperate situation that we cannot fix ourselves. We've abandoned the Lord and our repentance doesn't meet the marks. Can you feel the weight of that on our own? We just can't do it. And the consequences are dire. Our only hope is for God to step in and do something about it. And in his grace, he did. Uh, our last point is that we have a God who pursues the unrepentant. Uh, look with me at the last sentence of chapter 6 and the verse, the first in chapter 7. God says, I would restore the fortunes of my people. I would heal Israel. And then wonderfully, at the end of verse 13, I long to redeem them. I long to redeem them. In spite of everything God's people have done, he longs to make things right. Even when they're running headlong away from him, God relentlessly pursues his people. That is what he's like. And he'll catch them. Verse 12, when they go, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like the birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. For Israel, because of their unrepentance, that will look like facing God's judgment themselves. Verse 13, Woe to them, because they have strayed from me, destruction to them, because they have rebelled against me. And that is what we deserve. Like Titus 3 says that at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Guys, we were like the Israelites, a living in rebellion against God, unrepentant and destined for destruction. But listen to what comes next. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us. And not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. God saved us. And not because of good things we've done, but because of His mercy. That means that if we're trusting Jesus this evening, we have truly repented. Uh, there was a time when God brought you from death to life. And when we turned from idols to trust the living and true God. That is the gospel of grace. When we were unrepentant and hard-hearted, God pursued us and found us and gave us a new heart that we could truly return to him. Now, God didn't wait for us to polish ourselves up he didn't wait for our repentance to, to meet these marks. No, he came to us when we were unrepentant. And Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Well, imagine a daughter who has run away from her parents and rejecting everything they stand for. She's run away to a, a far off city where she's got in the, with the wrong crowd. She's addicted to drugs and is selling her body to pay for them. She's oblivious to the mess she's in and has cast all memory of her family far, far away. But they haven't forgotten her. No, her dad isn't sat at home with his feet up, wondering if maybe she might come through the door. No, he's out every day looking for her. Every night he's combing the streets, calling her name, longing to find her, longing to bring her home. He's risked his life in some of the shadiest spots in the city, asking anyone and everyone if they know where she is. Until eventually, 
he finds her, sleeping rough in a back alley. He calls her name, and she's up in a flash. It takes a moment for her to recognize him, but once she does, she's off, running down the street, away from him as quick as she can. She can't bear to face him again, not after everything she's done. But her dad won't let her go. He takes off running after her, crying out her name, calling her to come home, crying out that he loves her, that he has a way to make things right. She can't outrun him, and he catches her, wrapping his arms around her, holding her tight as the waves of tears flood out, and he will not let her go. That is what our God is like. He pursued us while we ran headlong away from him. And once he's got us, he will never let us go. As people living in a, a post-fall world, we will continue to sin. And we'll continue to need to repent. And by God's grace, that repentance will meet the marks we looked at. It will last and it will be deep and it will kill sin. Not perfectly, sometimes not even well. But as the Spirit works in us, to shape us into the likeness of Jesus, those barriers we looked at will be broken down. As we're humbled, as we learn to live wholeheartedly for Jesus, as our idols are put to death, as we become quicker to return to the Lord and put our security in him, then by God's grace, our repentance will become longer lasting. It will become deeper and further reaching and it will look like sin being put to death in our lives until the day we fully return to the Lord when he calls his bride home. Because we won't wander away. Now, brothers and sisters, that is our destiny. That is our hope. So will you turn afresh to the Lord today who has pursued you and restored you and redeemed you at immeasurable cost to his one and only son. Will you return to him, your loving heavenly father who has made a way for you to come home? Stop running and return. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you that as we ran headlong away from you, you have pursued us. Thank you that you paid it all on the cross for us to come home to be yours, to be restored and redeemed to you. And Lord, in light of that, would we be people who repent, who return quickly? Lord, I pray that you would you'd do that in us uh, by your spirit and for your glory.